So we need to have an idea of what we want to install, sockets, lights, switching, appliances. And then we need to firm this up into some sort of plan. We go through it room by room, decide what and where we want to install things. How many sockets do we want? How many lights do we want? How we're going to switch it? Then we can divide it up into circuits and start designing the actual electrical installation. There are design principles we can follow to give us a clear pathway through the design process. These design principles are based on the design and verification course, the 2396, and that's uh, an advanced exam, it's a level 4 exam, and it's used for complex installations, but there's nothing stopping us from using the same principles for our domestic design, and I'm finding actually that domestic installations are getting more and more complex. It's good to have a structure to your design process, so we might as well start off with this, and it's only going to put you in good stead for any future designs as well. So these design principles will guide us right from the origin of the supply to the final loading. And are there any environmental conditions which will affect our choice of cable? Then we can consider the type of cable and how it's going to be installed, taking time to consider safe working practices during the installation work. Then we can think about how we can protect the circuits and how people will interact with the equipment. And once we've considered all these points, we can start to calculate the size of cable we need. But why do we need to consider the size of the cable? Well, it's to provide for a satisfactory life of the conductors and insulation subjected to the thermal effects of carrying current for a prolonged period of time in normal service. Basically, we don't want the cable to overheat, do we? And when we've calculated the correct cable size, we can confirm that the cable can operate continuously under full load conditions without being damaged and that the cable is able to withstand fault currents flowing through the cable, and we're ensuring that the protective devices are effective during earth faults, and we're also ensuring that the supply to the load avoids excessive voltage drops. So we want to make sure that cable doesn't overheat and start to melt, and pass on that thermal energy to its surroundings, the load, the building, the supply equipment, because it's a fire risk. And if we do get a fault, we need to make sure that the cable can handle any fault currents it can flow. In a fault condition, you could get hundreds of thousands of amps. We're making sure the cable can handle the energy, the heat created during that short fault without damage to the cable. And faults will happen, even something as simple as a light bulb failing. You've probably all experienced a fuse tripping when a light bulb blows, and that's because there's a big release of energy. Imagine having to change a cable every time you have a fault. Every time a light bulb blows, we blow the cable as well. And this fault can be large enough to actually break the cable. If that's a CPC, you've lost your fault protection. What we don't want to do, though, is limit the fault current. It's important to have a high fault current so the protected device will operate in the correct time. And the loop impedance, earth fault loop impedance, is vital to make sure that if you do have a fault, enough current will flow down the cable into the protected device and trip it. Volt drop is a decrease of electrical potential along the length of a cable. The longer the cable, the greater the voltage drop. We want to make sure that that voltage drop is not so great that it affects the operation of any appliances or equipment. We can use it to verify that its circuit, the cable, is not too long. So let's have a go at using the design principles to design this circuit feeding and immersion heater for a hot water tank. So we start with the characteristics of the supply. Are we at the origin of the installation? That's where power comes into the building. Or are we further down the line fed from other distribution boards? We consider our earthing system. In this case, it's a TNS. It's an AC supply, 50 hertz. And it's a one phase, two wire. Could be three phase, but our installation is only single phase. Consider the voltage, the ZD, and the perspective fault current. And what's the type and rating of this service cutout fuse? Next, we look at the nature of the demand. It's got to be a radial circuit. The load is 3 kilowatts, and that's a fixed load. We'd like it to be a dedicated circuit, just feeding this one appliance. And it's a backup. And even though we can't apply diversity, it's going to be useful to know that it's a backup supply when we do our maximum demand. That's why it's useful to find out any relevant information so that you can understand the working life of this circuit.
Then we've got to think about environmental conditions and what should we consider. And this is all from Appendix 5 in BS 7671. Appendix 5 is really quite useful. It might seem a little bit complicated or over the top. Don't forget this is based on the 2396 design and verification. It's often used for complex installations where you need good documentation of your design process. But it's useful for us to use as a platform to work from. There's three categories, environment, utilisation and construction of buildings. So the first letter refers to the category environment, utilisation or construction of buildings. The second letter relates to the nature or the external influence. The number at the end relates to the class within each external influence. You can see the full list of external influences here. And if we zoom in for water, for example, it'll actually give us categories. Negligible, drops, sprays, splashes, jets, waves, immersion, submersion. So we're getting a description of the source and magnitude of the influence of water. And then we're getting guidance on selection of equipment and IP ratings to deal with those conditions. It's all very helpful, and it does this for each environmental influence. So I've been through the list, and I've taken note of the conditions I think will affect our installation. Let's have a look through them. The ambient temperature. This can vary. It can be very warm in a boiler cupboard, and it can also be very cold as well. So in the winter, pipe work might freeze. So do we need to consider pipe thermostats? Temperature and humidity is not listed in the book for some reason. Altitude, we don't have to worry about that. The water I've put down is negligible. Obviously, there's water in the tank, but that shouldn't be coming anywhere near our electrical supply. We're only in a vault situation. There's no cleaning as such, no sprays of water or jets of water. There's no rainwater. Well, there shouldn't be. Foreign bodies. We're not going to have any issues with dust, so we don't need a high ingress protection for our switching. IP2X will be fine. Corrosion output is negligible. Impact, this is negligible. Impact is something you want to think about, though. It's often when you've got things in cupboards, people use that as a store. So they bang all sorts of things in there, hoovers and whatever. People just throw everything in the cupboard. And that can damage accessories, so just something to bear in mind. Vibration, I've put that as low. But again, vibration is something you need to consider. You wouldn't want to be wiring a pump in twin and earth, solid twin and earth conductors. You'd want to use a flex for pumps because they do vibrate a little bit. And the solid conductors in twin and earth are not good for that. This is why I use flexible cable. It can deal with any slight movement. Other mechanical stresses aren't listed in the book. Chlora, but no hazard. Fauna, well, you might have to think about mice. Electromagnetic, level, solar, low, seismic, negligible, lightning, negligible, but we have surge protection now, don't we? Movement of air, low, wind, low. So utilisation, capabilities. This is people. I've gone for ordinary. It's just a standard house. But you might want to consider people that have got special needs or disabilities. Resistance is not applicable in the book. Contact with Earth. In this example, we're talking about contact with extraneous conductive parts. That's something that happens quite a lot. Evacuation, that's just normal. That's getting out the building in case of a fire. Materials, we haven't got any combustible materials. There's not a store of combustible materials or petrol or whatever in the houses that the building is potentially combustible. And the structure, uh, I've got no concerns there. So we're ready now to consider the types of wiring and methods of installation. In the previous sections we looked through, there's no particularly hard stresses on the cable. The impact on the cable is low. We don't have to worry too much about mechanical protection for the cable. So the thinking is to run the cable from the consumer unit in surface-mounted conduit into the floor void where it will be clipped direct to the joists. Then when it comes out of the floor, it will be chased into the wall. So a flat twin in earth would be the obvious choice for this installation. It's a domestic wiring cable. It can be installed in fixed installations. It can be surface clipped, where mechanical damage is not an issue. It's also suitable for conduit and it's suitable to be buried into plaster. There were no concerns of IP rating for the switching, so we're okay to use IP2X. So we're happy with the twin in earth for the fixed installation, but what about the final connection from the switch to the immersion heater? That's not part of the fixed installation, and you can't use twin in earth for final connections to appliances and such. 
So we need to use some kind of flexible cable. Now this cable is in free air. It's not completely clipped along its length. It's got cable support at the fuse spur and at the immersion heater, but it is in free air, especially when it's around hot pipework. The cable has to be protected from touching the hot pipework. A heat resistant flexible cable would be the obvious choice in this situation. But look at this more when we go through mutual detrimental influences. We've got to obviously follow safe work and practices where we're on site, following safe isolation at all times. And we need to consider other people working on site. Many people won't be electrically skilled. We need to think about the tools we use on site, access equipment, working at height. Falls from height are a major problem in construction. Do we need to have barriers and enclosures? Then we've got to think about our personal protective equipment. Masks, eye protection, hearing protection. We've got to protect ourselves from asbestos and silica dust. We need to keep ourselves safe. We also need to consider the safety of everybody else on site as well. Electrical supply systems for safety services and standby supplies. This is a very early consideration when we're looking to our design principles. And you can understand why. This is to do with services that protect life. Protection against fire. And we all know how important that is. You can imagine how complex designs are for large buildings, offices, cinemas, theatres, blocks of flats. We're doing a three-bedroom rewire. doesn't mean it's any less important. We've still got to give it good consideration because these are life safety systems and it gives you early warning that there's an issue, gives you an early warning of a fire, and it helps you escape. We need to consider isolation and switching. And we have got isolation. We'll have isolation in the fuse board. We've got the main switch. And we've also got the RCBO. And then further down the line, we've got the functional switch. MCBs can be used with isolation if you look at the regs. Even though it's only single pole. I would just add a little bit of caution to that. Especially on lighting circuits. You get something known as a shared neutral. I've got a video on that. I'll quickly go through the shared neutral here. Somebody's added a new light fitting. They've taken the feed for this lamp on the downstairs lighting circuit, but they've taken the neutral for this lamp on the upstairs lighting circuit. All will work fine. And you switch this fuse off and it'll switch this lamp off. It'll test like it's isolated. You switch this fuse off and this will test like it's isolated. We want to change this light fitting, so we switch the MCB off for the upstairs lighting circuit. We test live neutral earth. And it all tested. That's great. Now we disconnect this neutral here. And then we get a shock. So what's happened? Well, what's happened is that this neutral is no longer a neutral. Let's follow the flow of power here. This is fed from the downstairs lighting circuit. We'll follow the line. Comes up into the ceiling road onto the lamp. And what used to be the neutral is now just an extension of this line wire. Goes through the filament of the bulb. And on up into the... Ceiling rolls upstairs. And the disconnection here has broken that neutral. Even though we tested for dead, we isolated, this MCB is off. Problem is, this circuit is now getting its power from the downstairs MCB. So if you're ever working on lighting circuits and you disconnect your neutral, always retest. Make sure you haven't got a bottom neutral and this neutral has become live. So anyhow, we've got isolation for this circuit. We've got isolation from the consumer unit. We've also got a functional switch nearby, so we can actually switch on and off the immersion as and when we need it. So this is not classed as an isolator switch. As you can't lock it off, it's not an acceptable form of isolation. And I know I keep on saying it, but you've got to follow out your full isolation procedure when you're working on any electrical circuit. And if you walk away and come back again, test again. Make sure it's isolated. The method of fault protection we're going to use is ADS, Automatic Disconnection of Supply. But for every circuit, we also want to add additional protection, and that would be via an RCD. In this case, an RCBO, because we're adding individual RCD protection to every circuit. So we've got good discrimination for every circuit, and a fault on one circuit won't impact on another circuit. And because of the method of installation we've chosen, where the cable will be bedded in the fabric of the building, we have to add RCD protection anywhere. So it's got to be a 30 milliamp RCD, we know that. Uh, we need to calculate the rating of the RCBO, and we'll do that when we do our cable calculations. We need to consider accessibility 
to electrical equipment. In commercial work, you're trying to keep people away from the electrical installation. Obviously, in domestic installations, people need to operate things. They need to switch things on and off. They need access to things. You need access to your consumer unit for emergency and also so you can do the regular testing of your RCD. But you also want to place it where kids can't play around with it as well. You've got to consider who's actually going to be living in the building, the house. They've got a disability, they're their age. And so you design the installation for the person that's going to be living there. The building regulations document M gives guidance on the heights of sockets and switches. We then think about prevention of mutual detrimental influences. So we're making sure that our cables are installed to avoid any harmful influences between other electrical cables, such as in grouping, uh, between electrical services and non-electrical services, and mains cables in contact with extra low voltage cables, cables carrying different voltages, cables in contact with IT cabling, causing interference. Think about dissimilar metals causing corrosion. So we're just making sure that there's no harmful influence between our electrical installation and other parts of the building. We mentioned earlier that the cable could possibly come into contact with hot pipe work, and that would obviously be detrimental. It's detrimental to the cable. The insulation could start to melt, and eventually you might get to the bare conductors, which then might touch the copper pipe work, which could introduce a voltage onto the pipe work throughout the house. Or you could get a short, and it could actually blow a hole in the copper pipe work as well, with the obvious issues that causes. But this is quite a simple circuit, really, so there's not too many considerations here. So what we need to do now is work out the cable size. Uh, we've been through our design principles. We've looked at the supply. We've looked at the nature of the demand. Any supply systems for safety services, any environmental conditions, type of wiring and methods of installation, the protective equipment, the isolation and switching, protective devices and switching, the accessibility of the electrical equipment, and any prevention of mutual detrimental influences. And we are ready to start designing the cable. Appendix H of the on-site guide gives details of standard circuit arrangements for households and this can help simplify the design process. But I think it's very important to understand the design principles and then you can start utilising this. We'll talk about Appendix H in another video. These are the steps we need to follow to determine the size of the cable we're going to use. This is all based on Appendix 4 and BS7671. So we need to work out what our method of installation is going to be because that will have a factor on the cable. Then we'll calculate our design current, which is known as IB. Then we'll select the protective device, which is known as IN. Then we'll decide if overload protection is required. We then calculate IT, which is the tabulated value of current after the correction factors have been applied. We can then select a cable with effective current carrying capacity from tables 4D5 or 4D2A. And then finally, we'll check the volt drop. And then we'll know what cable we can use for the installation. And we've been through the full design process. And we're going to do some calculations of lots of different circuits in the next videos. So thanks very much for watching and take care.